All right, everybody. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So first off, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to ABA's, ABMA's Behavior Month. We are so excited to have you here for our live Q&A with our friends at San Diego. I'm Shannon College. I am on the CCA committee and I'm in a room full of penguins, so my apologies for that. Um, before we begin our session, just a few little logistical reminders. Um, during this session, please make sure that you are able to turn on your mic and your video. We will allow you guys the opportunity to do so. We just ask that when you aren't speaking to please have your mic off and uh, just try to prevent a little less background noise. I will also be muting because they seem to be very excited to be joining the meeting today too. Um, if you didn't notice, as soon as you logged in, it said the meeting is being recorded. So we are recording this just so that everyone is aware. And you guys will be able to view this recorded session later on. We'll be posting it on our Facebook page. So make sure that you check that out. And since this is a live Q&A, we encourage any questions that you guys might have. Now, a few other points to remind you of. If you are not yet a member of ABMA, now's the time. And I assume a lot of you have already gotten your memberships because I thought this was a members only access. But if you have any friends who are interested in joining, or if you're watching the recorded version of this and are interested in becoming a member of the ABMA, you get $5 off all memberships that are started during Behavior Month. And if you are an ABA member, an ABMA member, you think I would know how to say that right now, um, just make sure you check your emails because there's a lot of other great opportunities throughout this month. We have another fantastic talk coming up on Friday that you all will see me at. I'm gonna invite our co-hosts to go ahead and unmute themselves and turn their videos on and join us. And let's do a brief overview of who we are and um, a little bio of each one. Jessica, you're the first one who's on my screen. So I'll have you go first if you wanna do a short introduction. Sure, hi everyone. Uh, glad that you were able to join us. Uh, my name is Jessica Sheftel and I'm obviously with San Diego. We are now the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance and that um, incorporates both the zoo and the park as well as all of our um, field conservation sites. So I am one um, member of three in our Applied Wildlife Welfare Department, which you will meet the other two in just a second. Um, and my official title is Wildlife Welfare Specialist. I mainly um, have responsibilities at the zoo, but we do work as a team um, across all campuses. Jessica, you said part of your team is here. Do you want to announce who that is and then have them talk next? Yeah, yeah. So Louisa and Greg are here. So Louisa, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Louisa Radosevich. Um, I am also wildlife welfare specialist. So Jessica said she's mainly at the zoo and I am mainly at the park. But like she said, we do collaborate on a lot of different projects. Um, and I've, I'm the newest member of the team. I've been in this role for about a year, but I've been with the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance since 2017. Thank you so much for joining us today. Go ahead, Greg. So I'm Greg Vicino. I'm the curator of Applied Wildlife Welfare. Um, so I get to work with these two geniuses on a regular basis, which is my pleasure. Um, and so we, uh, like Jess said, you know, we're lucky enough we work for the Alliance. So we um, cover all facilities, um, some of our field sites as well, um, and get to work with all aspects of wildlife welfare. So if anybody has interactions with animals within this organization, um, we have we have a role in, in evaluating that, how that goes. Brittany and company, if you guys wanna introduce yourselves. Oh no, you're, I'm sorry. I thought I made you a co-host. You are not a co-host. That is our three hosts, fantastic. Sorry for that, thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and open up our Q&A session. So anyone who has a question and would like to unmute themselves, go ahead and go for it, or you can type it into the chat if you're more comfortable that way, and I'll make sure that our three hosts get to see those. So can you all hear me if I'm talking? Wonderful. Um, so my name is Brittany. Um, I am the education coordinator at Sarasota Jungle Gardens, which is a zoo and botanical gardens in Sarasota, Florida. Um, so I have uh, myself and some of my team here. Um, we're trying to do um, just extending education. Um, so we found out about this, um, this zoo meeting and we thought it would be a great opportunity just to hear from um, people that have a lot of experience with animal behavior and enrichment, um, as that's something that's really important to our program um, for building that up 
up and, and always improving it whenever we can. Um, so we deal um, specifically mostly with um, the ambassador animals here. So the animals that we train to um, do encounters or go out with the public. Um, we do a lot of interactions with the public with the animals. So that's mostly what our position is, um, taking care of them and training them. And so um, having that opportunity to also enrich them um, is a very important part of that for us. Um, and so I guess one question that I have for you um, is in general, how do you measure um, enrichment in um, either a behavioral way or just um, um, a way that you can really put down on paper um, to know how good an enrichment item is, um, especially when you have to consider, you know, how long you spend on making enrichment items or um, different things like that. That was a fight to see who was going to get to the unmute button first um, between me and Jess. And obviously, I got you. Um, so there's a couple of different ways. Uh, part of this uh, this ABMA work week that um, or this month, um, I, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, we we did a presentation or Jess did her presentation on on the enriched experiences. Right. And the idea of we're trying to shift our paradigm away from enrichment. Um, as an item or as something you construct, like you just said, right? So, so what we would consider to be an input, we're trying to shift enrichment from inputs to really valuing the measurement of outcomes, which is exactly what you're asking, right? How do we determine if, if that behavior is happening? Um, and especially when we compare it to how the, the cost and time, both money and time it is to create enrichment. So the outcome-based husbandry programs that we use and, um, and that we develop are focused solely on measuring the frequency and diversity of, of behaviors, or mostly on the frequency and diversity of behaviors, right? So the outcomes that we see, um, not in a chronic, I mean, sorry, not in an acute fashion, right? So the traditional enrichment is, I put the boomer ball in, it has, you know, mice in it. She played with it for 10 minutes. If that's a high level of engagement. I'm going to score it as a five on my engagement list. And now I'm going to move on because I've got to go build something else or clean something else. Right. Um, so what we're really looking for is building husbandry programs that integrate that stuff into the way you, so you would never feed that cat or whatever it is. You would never feed it any other way, except for a way that involves high levels of engagement. When we do that, we can measure their chronic behavioral changes, right? So we can measure their overall behavioral repertoire across a period of time. So it's it's kind of a complex answer, but the the reality is is um, and I'll let Jess touch on this because I think she I think she touched on it in the presentation, is that there's a significant amount of stuff that you're doing to enhance those the the environment of those animals that you're probably not recording. Because we've been trained to record the thing. We've been trained to record the the ball or the chew toy or the thing, that's what we're trained to, because that's what someone wants to look at. Um, but but again, I'll hand this off to Jas, but, but I bet that the uh, a significant amount of the husbandry that you're already providing for these animals is meeting those enhancement needs at the, at the base level of enhancement needs that are required by regulatory agencies. You just don't record it because we're not trained to. So with that, Jess. Yeah, I think um, just just to add on to that, I think it's it's kind of this fight between the requirements and wanting to do the right thing, right? We know we need to record enrichment because that's how we've been trained. That's how a lot of the regulations are. That's how a lot of our facilities, you know, want us to record it. But at the same time, I think we've come to the conclusion that if we have a comprehensive husbandry program that is focused on behaviors, that's focused on outcomes, that we know these are all things that are beneficial to the animal. And if that's like your SOP that you always feed in a challenging way, both physically and cognitive, then you don't have to write something down every day, right? So like you don't have to write down the object or the input because you're focusing on the behaviors and what the animal's doing. And you know, to get even even further away from, you know, a lot of places record indirect or direct evidence of whether they engage with enrichment and on a scale like Greg was talking about, but really looking at the overall behavior of the animal, not just in the time that they're engaged with that object is probably more telling whether that input was valuable for them. So um, we've been doing a lot of work, Louisa, especially using a program called Zoo Monitor to um, capture some 
some overall activity budgets, whether it's just space use or general activity budget, and um, really encouraging and training a lot of our frontline animal care staff in doing behavioral observations, even if it's just a really quick kind of down and dirty, you know, assessment sheet that they're doing and giving them that um, power to say, it's okay if I take 20 minutes out of my day to watch my animal or I can take 30, right? Like, and having management start to remove some of those roadblocks as well. So again, it's, it's a huge um, kind of multifaceted answer, but hopefully that, that answered your question. And, and again, to ping pong back onto that, what, in that presentation uh, that we recorded, I think it goes over how we use our, our basic animal welfare assessment tool. Um, and if you use that quarterly, you're asking, you know, so the team that's sitting there, you're asking yourselves, oh, does, does Armando eat in a way that matches his natural history? You know, how would I score that? Is it a yes or a no? You know, those are all measurable outcomes. Does Armando spend the same amount of time eating as he would? Uh, you know, in, in comparison to his natural history, does he process the food the same way? Same way? Does he find the food the same way? Does he acquire it the same way? Asking those like validated kind of outcome questions, um, you would see that change over time, right? So if you if you did that in the first quarter of 2022, and the answers were no to all of those, and you changed your husbandry routine, and in the second quarter of 2022, the answer becomes yes. There's your record, right? There's your, there's your assessment of efficacy um, based on your husbandry program. And, and again, taking a critical look at, um, at what, what, how heavy that requirement is for in, an enriching experience. I wanna, I wanna have Louisa talk a little bit about her, the, the field uh, places that she works with, like at the Safari Park, they have these massive mixed species fields. And typically, the understanding is that, you know, because it's mixed species, there's giraffe and buffalo and rhino and all that stuff, that we don't need enrichment, right? They live out in this complex world and we don't need enrichment. And it's probably right thinking, but she still has to be able to assess whether or not those animals are meeting those needs. So I was just going to see if she wanted to give some examples of, of some of the things they're doing out there. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like Greg said, a lot of our field habitats, you have multiple species and, and at the safari park, they're experiencing the environment like we would expect them to because they're they're out in these these large habitats that have opportunities for grazing opportunities to experience seasons but at the same time we have to make sure that they're meeting the right opportunities so for instance we have a rhino working group here at the safari park because we have a lot of we have four different species of rhinos and we also have our rhino rescue center um, and one of the uh, recent focuses of the rhino working group was uh, interspecies interactions. And they did um, a whole experience with um, elephant and elephant interaction where they provided elephant scent and sound as a cue for a new wallow experience. And then also for a new browse opportunity that they wouldn't get otherwise. Um, and so what they, the team actually found was that these black rhinos um, they were, they were challenged in a way that they hadn't been before. So the team put a big log in one of the wallows and one of the black rhinos didn't know what to do with it. She had no, she had no idea because she hadn't been challenged in that way. So even in some of our larger habitats, using the assessments and these experiences can really provide us with more opportunities we hadn't even thought of um, and giving those animals experiences that, again, we didn't, we didn't think maybe they needed, but they do. Yes, thank you. That does uh, definitely help answer the question. Um, and I think gives us a better way of thinking of it as well. Uh, kind of building off of that, my next question, actually, you already kind of brought it up, but do you have, and it's a really broad question, so it might be kind of difficult to answer, um, but do you have any suggestion for ways that you go about making sure that you are um, meeting those natural behaviors or encouraging those natural behaviors that that animal would exhibit in the wild. Um, like you had talked about making sure that they're spending that same amount of time um, feeding as they would. Um, and um, like we have uh, three black and white rough lemurs here. Um, and so they're uh, definitely a main focal point for us because um, because they are primates and they're so intelligent. We're, you know, we're really trying to, uh, and they're new to us. So we're trying to really develop that program um, um, with them in mind, uh, making sure that we are following um, uh, that same, you know, guideline kind of like you had talked about.
Yeah, um, I'm not sure if you got a chance to watch watch the presentation, um, but Greg also um, referred to the one that we did at the beginning of the month. I believe it was actually October 1st. And we have a whole program called the Enriched Experiences Program. And we have a whole set of tools that we use in order to really flush out what behaviors um, our animals could be exhibiting and how we can elicit those behaviors. But again, coming from that behavioral or outcome um, base first and working back to the inputs, to the objects that, or whatever it is that we need to provide to them. So um, it's really just, just thinking about the main categories are behaviors. We talk about what context and components we might see those behaviors in, what sort of natural history adaptations they have, whether it's physical or cognitive and then what outcomes we would expect to see. And from there, then we're able to think about the input. So again, it's thinking about what behavior do I wanna to promote today instead of what object do I have to give today? So that's really kind of the general core of our philosophy. Yeah, and, I, and um, again, you know, what, we've had this kind of esoteric conversation amongst ourselves, specifically as of late about this idea of um, as they would in the wild. And, you know, that's such a, you know, that term standalone as they would in the wild. And that, you know, that's an idea that's, that's, it's beautiful, right? It's really nice. And it's been around for a long time. And I've always thought, we've always kind of targeted it, but it wasn't until recently that I realized that the way we go about trying to achieve this, the way they act in the wild or the way they behave in the wild is very different than what a lot of other people are saying about it, right? So again, we're looking at the frequency and diversity of behavior, but we're also looking at how, how, how they act in the wild is essentially how they respond to challenges or cues and make a choice that provides them with something they want or something they avoid, right? That's how they act in the wild. You know, when, it, when a bear lives in, in, you know, grizzly bear lives in, in Alaska, as soon as the days start getting shorter, it knows it needs to go get salmon because it needs to fill up, right? So that's a choice that it makes based on a cue. It's like any of the training you guys do. Um, so if you relocate that bear to the Northeast of the United States, he's gonna do the same thing because there's gonna be the same cues, right? He's gonna to respond to a cue to get what he wants and to avoid what he doesn't. It's, it's again, I, I mean, I look at it like that. So lemurs, the black and white rough lemurs, you know, how are they, how do they forage? Like that's a perfect example. One of the, one of the ones that's probably the easiest one for us to look at is, you know, they forage, sometimes they suspensory feed, right? So sometimes they hang on by their feet and they suspensory feed. And that's fundamentally different, both behaviorally and physically, fundamentally different from sitting at a stainless steel bowl and shoving your face into food. And also fundamentally different from reaching out from a very wiggly terminal branch to try and pluck berries from another tree while avoiding being picked off by an eagle. Those are, they're all eating, they're all foraging, they're all what we call foraging, but they're fundamentally different. And by encouraging those fundamentally different things, we're mimicking behavior from the wild because they're facing with a challenge, they're faced with a challenge. There's a cue that indicates to them that that challenge is being presented. They make the decision to execute the behavior and they either acquire what they want or they avoid what they don't. Um, so I don't, you know, I mean, there's tons of traditional enrichment for, for lemurs all over the world, all over the place. You have a USDA requirement for, um, for a, a, a high quality enrichment program. Um, but I think that, you know, by looking at how those physical behaviors and adaptations work together, to respond to cues from the environment, you can make an inc incredibly rich life for those old dudes. Questions? Okay, yeah, thank you for that. That's, um, yeah, those, those are definitely things we've been trying to adapt and like the suspensory feeding was one of the ones that we've been wanting to touch on for sure um, lately, but um, you said no. Okay. No, not really. Okay, I think those are the main questions we had. I don't wanna to take too much time away from everybody else, but I really appreciate that feedback. Thank you. All right, and I know that uh, I have not yet had the opportunity to catch up on all of our videos that we've had this behavior month. So just wanted to remind everyone, um, we do have a YouTube channel. You wanna search the Animal Behavior Management Alliance. You have to spell it all out, otherwise it's gonna be very hard to find. I'm going to add a link in our chat though so that you can go ahead and just click on that. 
and then that way you can go ahead and subscribe from there. But apparently I didn't copy the link, so I'm, I promise I will eventually add it. Um, do we have any other questions? You guys, uh, it's a small group. You feel free to go ahead and unmute yourselves and chat away. I keep teaching people this fun trick I just learned, but if you want to copy the chat, if you go to the chat and just in the lower right hand corner where you would put your comment, those three dots, you can copy the, the chat, which any, if any other links were put in there or that last link, and then you can save it for later. It'll go, it'll download right to your computer. Is that your question, Nikki? No, it's my teaching moment. <laughs> We I, just, that. I just, from being both at the San Jose Wildlife Alliance and on the ABMA board, I just want to thank you guys so much for your time and always trying to get this information out there because it's so like, why haven't we didn't been doing this all along? Like, I just love managing animals this way. And uh, I know we still have a ways to go with, with um, you know, growing it, but um, it's just so much fun to, to see the creativity. And I try to join as many different enriched experience team meetings as I can, because it's always fun to listen and contribute and uh, just see how the rest of the zoo is being managed in this very apropos and probably zoo unique way. All right, I did have a question that I could ask on behalf of some others. So uh, you guys mentioned you have a lot of resources available to you to help analyze how enrichment is being utilized and if an animal is interacting with it. But what about at some smaller facilities where we're basically back to kind of like ethograms? And how, how do you justify accounting for time or how, what are some tips that you have for how we can account for time and reasonability for evaluating enrichment in those circumstances. So do you have any tips for how to be able to evaluate it on a smaller scale that's less time consuming and maybe a little less uh, definitive? Does that make sense? I'll start, but I think that uh, both Jess and Louisa probably have some contribution to this. But I think when we, as time is obviously an issue everywhere we go, there's never, I've never, we've never consulted I've never worked in an animal care facility. I've never met anybody in animal care. I've never even seen or heard of anything in any animal care field where someone had enough time, where someone told me that they were good on time. We're good, I don't need any more time. Everybody needs more time. Nobody has enough time, that's standard issue. Um, one of the things we ask is we ask to really take a critical look at that. And we say, really, um, is it because you work from six to 2.30? Because most animals don't operate on a six to 2.30 schedule. So is that maybe why you have no time? Um, or, you know, is it that you spend time doing things that you don't need to do that aren't as important as ensuring that you're maximizing the welfare of, of captive animals? So that's the first thing we say, especially in a solid, small zoo, it's easier to move quickly. We're a massive organization. We move incredibly slowly. You know, we make a policy change and it's like six months before you can even start to see evidence of it being documented, let alone moving forward. Small zoos, you can move really quickly, right? So one of the things you could do is take a critical look at your schedule, take a critical look at the way you schedule your time. And is it really animal biased or is it human biased, right? Is it, is it based on, on what, what we as humans think matches or what we're used to? That's one strategy. I think the other strategy is the, the outcome-based husbandry techniques that, that we use are very heavily front-loaded. Meaning you do a lot of the work in the beginning in working groups and things like that. You know, it's not building enrichment, it's it's building your brain, you know, walking through what it's what it actually looks like, what it, the difference is, the physical differences between the lemur suspensory feeding or stretch feeding, right? Like you you spend a lot of time doing that. You end up with a bunch of outcomes, a bench of a bunch of measures like his legs are stronger, he spends more time suspending upside down eating. Um he effectively eats his latency to determine what how, what strategy to use is is different his problem solving skills are better he's more response problem solving skills you could measure with training right he's more responsive to training um so you do all those ahead of time you list all those out ahead of time so when it comes time for your for your and and if you think about all husbandry being integrated um when it comes time for you to record your the efficacy of your program those are all yes or no questions now. 
You have a list of yes or no questions that you didn't really know you had. Yeah, he does suspend from the thing. Yeah, his legs are stronger. Yeah, he's more responsive to training. Yeah, the latency between when he faces a problem, when he solves it is, is shorter. So now all of a sudden, you've kind of gone full circle back to that checkbox simplicity, but there's a deep built-in complexity to it that you did ahead of time. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, you know, again, I think Jess and Luis have something to say, but I also see Mindy Albright's on here. You know, Mindy runs an elephant program where, you know, one of the main measures that they use to determine whether or not the husbandry program is effective in meeting the needs of these animals is the responsiveness to problem solving. Whether that be via training or whether that be just opportunistically watching how they, they deal with it. And that's that's a validated measure. You can use that, right? You can say, you know, especially in a smaller place, he's more responsive to this. He moved quicker. He, there's less time between facing a problem and solving a problem. That's a that's an that's an okay thing to record. Um, so again, it's those are the two recommendations I would make: is that do the work ahead of time and take a really hard look, a critical look at whether or not your schedule actually makes sense for. Um, the animals that you care for, and it's a balance, right? You have the animals that you care for, you have the board of directors, you have the guests, you have your staff, you have, you know, a lot of things, but that's a little bit easier with 12 team members as opposed to 1,200. Um, and, you know, we can do it at both, but it's just something to take a look at. Yeah, and I would just add, if you are in the position to um, make the decision or to influence the decision of just giving your staff the freedom to watch your animals. I think that's a huge su success, right? Just knowing that your management is okay with you standing out in front of a habitat for 20 minutes and simply just watching the animal. And that you've talked about that with your team about how valuable it, it is. And it's not seen as, oh, well, she's just being lazy. She's just standing around for 20 minutes, right? Cause that's kind of like historically where a lot of a lot of that has come from. Um, and in addition to that, just really simplistically, if you put a check sheet on a place where you pass by the animal's habitat, where you just listed out very simple behaviors or behaviors that you think are valuable, and you can just put a check whenever you see them. So you could say, okay, there's three of us. Every time we walk by the serval cage, we're just gonna record what she's doing. So is she laying down? Is she walking? Is she sleeping? And that at least, even though it's not, you know, completely objective, it starts to give you an idea of what the animals are doing. So when you make changes, you can keep recording the, that in the same way, and you might get a sense of what's changing or what's not changing based on the inputs that you're you're giving. So that, that's a really a really simple one that that you can start with. Louisa, did you have anything? I think you both pretty much said it. I was just going to add that it doesn't. We tend to think of behavioral observations as being something very complex, but a lot, some of our teams do 10 minute observations a day and they, they schedule that in. So it's, it's built into their schedule so that they do that every day. And it's a very simple space use and behavior observation. It doesn't take a lot of training and it doesn't take a lot of time. So I think sometimes these observations can be more simple, like Jess said, than, than we sometimes think they need to be. You can randomize those 10 minute you know, observations per day and have at the end of the week an inordinate amount of data. And there's plenty of um, literature to suggest that that's, and we've seen it ourselves, that that follows the same pattern as, you know, constantly monitoring the animal over a period of time, right? You know, it's usually sufficient. Um, and, and Jess's strategy with the, the check sheet, we employ that a lot. We do that a lot of times just to identify what time of day we want to observe the animal. Because typically what you find out is, oh, he really, he paces, obviously the first, the 25 minutes while he's waiting for you to put his dinner in or his breakfast in and then he's pacing for the 25 minutes while he's waiting for you to put the afternoon meal and do your final check and then once you go home he stops pacing um you know like that's we we identify those areas where we can then then you can target your your um attack so that's they're they're incredibly simple we're not i mean we're all behaviorists, we all believe firmly in behavioral uh, observations and all that stuff. So I don't want to say um, that they're easy. Complex behavioral observations are still the most, the, the gold standard, but you can achieve what you need to achieve with these quick, quick strategies. And I love the use of cameras now. It seems like they're getting more and more um, cost efficient. And then you could watch those whenever you want, or you can watch them from your phone when you're not there. Don't break any union guidelines, but 
the cameras have been huge and then you can show other people so you can kind of support your observation you know objectively so cameras like nest cameras and trail cams and stuff are getting more and more affordable and often donors will pay for certain things too so sometimes you can find resources um, outside of your regular budget and people will donate stuff like that to you great so anyone else have any quick questions i know we said this was only going to be about 30 minutes long but i did want to make sure that we had a chance to address any pertinent questions that anyone had i didn't see anything come up in the chat though i don't see anyone unmuting all right well, if you guys do want to go back and review this, it will be posted on our Facebook page later and also on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Jessica, Louisa, and Greg for joining us today and for your presentation. Don't forget, guys, um, tell all of your friends to join $5 off their membership to become part of the ABMA this month. And coming up on Friday, I will be hosting Ken Ramirez's webinar, so make sure you check that out as well. We're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat, so any of you who were our uh, moderators for this or our hosts for this, make sure you check those out. Thanks everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your day and happy behavior month. Thanks, Shannon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.